Hello, hello. That's going to be an awkward freeze frame uh, on the video recording when you click on it. It's going to be me going. Anyway, hello, welcome. It's Tuesday, 7 p.m. on the East Coast, February 9th. My name is Ethan. This is just Ethan. Let me know you're here. Say hello. Where are you viewing from? Give a shout out. And uh, let's get things rolling shortly. Always give a couple minutes to let people get in and get situated. So say hello. Jesse Lowell, it has been too long. How are you? Do, I would imagine, pretty soon. Hi, Yvonne. And there's Mary from Central California. Hi, Mary. Yeah, if you're just joining us, please say hello. Let us know where you're where you're viewing from. Give us a shout out. It's Don from Washington, D.C. Hope you're well as well, Don. Uh, Anthony from Toronto, Canada. It's Eileen. My son, Joe, will be coming in on my screen name soon. Awesome. Welcome, Joe. Look forward to having him here. Oh, there's Deirdre. Hi, Deirdre. So we will get started in about 30 to 45 seconds. Uh, let's see. Jessica wrote, I'm good. OMG, yes. Baby due in 12 weeks, maybe 11. I'll text you later to share some updates. I would love that. Congratulations. I'm super excited to meet little Jess. Um, hi, love, Lana. Good to see you. OCD Interrupted, which is Melanie from Los Angeles. Barbara in Illinois. Gretchen in New Jersey. There's Dave. Hope you're well, my friend. Uh, there's Katie eating veggie burgers with the kitties. I'm downstairs, Georgia. <laughs> downstairs, Georgia. Um, there's Brandon. No, Brandon. From Brandon. From Brandon? Gene? From Brandon? Or Brandon. I'm so confused. All right. Let's get rolling. My name is Ethan. Nope, not yet. I mean, yes, yet. I'm just asking a quick question behind the scenes, which is not working. Kind of weird. Uh, Connie from Toronto. Hey, Connie. So... I hope everyone's having a great evening. It has been a a long day for me. I'm curious if it's been a long day for you, but a good day nonetheless. My name is Ethan. This is just Ethan. In case you don't know, I'm a national advocate for the International OCD Foundation, which simply means I have OCD and I won't stop talking about it. So, um, so if you're here, that's what we're going to talk about. Um, Rochelle is here from Mars. Hi, Rochelle. Welcome. Rochelle, you're not, from, the strange thing is I actually know where you're from, but it's good to see you, Rochelle. Nikki Bradley, all the way from Dublin. Um, good to see you, Nikki. So let's get some housekeeping out of the way and then we'll get straight to it. So this town hall is intended to serve as, well, this is not a town hall. This is just Ethan. I should change this. This just Ethan is intended to serve as educational content and is not intended to replace therapy because I'm, I'm not a therapist. For treatment related questions, please be sure to work with your local provider or contact a local clinician. The International OCD Foundation is not a crisis hotline and should not be used if you are in distress or feel unsafe. If you are in crisis or you're ever feeling suicidal or unsafe, please go to your local emergency room, call 911, or call the Suicide Prevention Hotline at 800-273-8255. Um, as always, we like to be respectful and kind in this room during these broadcasts. These will be living on social media for years and years to come. But as always, we want to create as safe a space as possible for us to have meaningful and supportive conversation all around. So we encourage you to be open. No subject is off limits, except medication. I don't talk about medication because I'm not a psychiatrist either. I'm nothing. Um, so just keep that in mind when you're asking um, questions or, or divulging information. So. Housekeeping out of the way, I think we should start with a big, deep breath. I would ask your thoughts, but we're just going to go in on this. On three, let's just take a big, deep breath. And hold it. And exhale. I probably should have explained the hold for three or four seconds prior to the deep breath in. Let's try that one more time. Let's breathe in deep, hold it for maybe a count of two or three, and then slowly exhale. Here we go. On three. One, two, three. Big deep, deep breath in. I 
I always find that gets me grounded a little bit, gets me more in tune with the here and now. Um, somebody said hi. Oh, yeah, Mario uh, from Beirut, Lebanon. Welcome, Mario. Thank you so much for joining. What time is it in Beirut? All right. So as always, we've changed up the structure a little bit. I encourage you to comment, ask questions right off the bat. I like to keep this as conversational as possible from the beginning, but I always like to start start with a topic and probably pose a question. So the topic for tonight or that I wrote is dot, 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 but my OCD is different. My OCD, uh, it's 2 a.m. in Beirut. Well, thank you so much for being up. Really appreciate it. Uh, just discussing your channel last night. That's awesome. Appreciate it, Mario. So I hear so much. Hello, Debbie from Boston. I hear so much, and I said it myself, that my OCD is different. I think the first question I want to ask everybody is, do you feel that way? Do you feel that your OCD is different? If so, why? Um, and let's start with that. Let's just start with, do you feel your OCD is different? And if so, I'm curious why you feel that way. Or, or if you've thought that in the past, maybe that's not where you are at this moment. Um, hey, David Dowdy, good to see you. I love that everybody's talking and having good conversation. That's awesome. And, and I'm getting to a point here, which is, which is, I think a lot of people, yes, because I have personal harm element too. Thank you, OCD Interrupted. I appreciate that. Uh, mine, Connie wrote in the past, um, Katie wrote, but mine really is this time. I swear, yes, I always feel like that. Um, uh, Ditsodis said it could be my God complex, but yes. Oh, the God complex. My OCD is different because it causes me to mumble stuff and blurt stuff out. Okay. Uh, personally don't have it, but my family member does feeling optimistic since my loved one finally started ERP today. Gretchen, that's awesome. Um, congratulations to your loved one. For the record, we should not be ever have to congratulate somebody for accessing treatment. It should be available all the time to everyone. So, but congratulations, Gretchen. And thank you for being here and supporting your loved one. I think that's amazing. If you have any questions and, and that is a, a um, caveat that I want to say is, is although we're going to talk on a topic, no questions are off limit. If there's something that's been on your mind in the last couple of weeks that you would like to talk about or address, don't hesitate to drop it in the comments and we will definitely talk about it. Uh, Amy wrote, my nine-year-old son has Tourette's OCD. It seems completely different than anything I've ever read about. Well, Amy, we can definitely talk about that. If I know I suffer from contamination and superstition, but I've learned many people feel like I do. Um, no, I thought so, but, but come to find out that I share this with so many. Exactly. Um, Debbie wrote, it's not different. It just goes along with recovering alcoholic and they have not done enough research on the dual, on these dual diagnosis. I am a perfectionist and checker. They lack in this area. Debbie, um, I will weigh in on that. Um, don't let me forget, because we should talk about um, the co-occurrence of OCD and substance use um, disorder, including alcohol. Um, in essence, it looks like a lot of people have experienced some iteration of a feeling like your OCD is different. The reason I wanted to bring this up is um, this thinking is 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 very very common, as we're saying, and a lot of people saying I used to think that, or I do think that, or I did think that, um, and and through OCD education, uh, we find out that it is not different, um, and symptoms can be different. But but I want to pose the next question to you all, which is, why is it important to acknowledge that your OCD is not different? Why is it important to acknowledge that your OCD is not different? Um, and I want to break this down a little bit. I am not in any way saying that that your circumstances aren't different. I'm in no way saying that your symptomatology or symptoms or exact circumstances, like I said, or your situation isn't different or unique um, to you. Um, absolutely, they are. But I'm super curious why I feel like, it's my own personal opinion, why I feel like the mentality and the mindset of thinking why my, my OCD is different, why this can be potentially detrimental or maybe not. Curious to your thoughts. Mike Sizemore in the house, everyone. Hey, hey, Mike, good to see you. So Katie wrote, because the content is irrelevant, it's just latched onto what is important to you. Treatment doesn't change. 
Um, Gwen, Gwen responded to Vicky, it can work. Um, I have worked success successfully with people with exactly that type of OCD, lots of imaginal exposures. It requires creativity on the therapist part, absolutely. Barbara wrote, because I'm not alone, treatment will work because it has worked for so many. I love that. Don screamed Mike. While it's not an answer to my question, he is excited to see Mike. We're always excited to see Don. Jennifer wrote, if you believe it is different, it can lead to helplessness or hopelessness in treatment. I, I love that answer, Jennifer. Thank you for that. So this is what I relate to. And this is why um, it's so important to um, separate the disease from the disorder. Before I go into this, Debbie wrote, it's the same as an alcoholic. I may have had different consequences. However, I'm still an alcoholic. Anyone who had OCD, I can relate to them and understand their thinking. I think that feeling like your OCD is different is very isolating. Rochelle, spot on. So to, to tee off, and please keep weighing in, but um, to tee off of Michelle and Jennifer's um, comments, let's put Jennifer, uh, Jess, would you mind putting Jennifer's comment on, which is 7, 10 p.m.? If you believe it is different, it can lead to helplessness or hopelessness in treatment. So I think the first thing is that if you look at the trajectory of OCD, we experience obsessions and compulsions, and we have no clue what we're experiencing. We, we don't know what it is. We aren't um, educated to OCD. Why, why should we be if, unless somebody in our family or friends have had it and we can identify it, but most of us had it come around as early as we can remember or at some point during puberty or college or postpartum or during a certain, and we're, we're basically like, what the heck is going on? Um, that isolation, that level of secrecy, being afraid to talk about it, being afraid, um, being afraid to to tell people because they think you may be crazy, that all leads to this sort of belief that what you're thinking is different, the way your brain is acting is different, um, and and by the time you get a diagnosis of OCD, um, depending on how long, you can very much think that your entire circumstance and your OCD is just a different kind of OCD. So I relate this to my story, and that's all I can really speak to. Um, so, and, and continue Jennifer's point directly, where are you eating? That looks familiar. Anyway, sorry. But, um, and Marilyn wrote, knowing it's not different means there is someone out there who can understand what it's like and can commiserate 100%. So as everybody just said, it can lead to hopelessness, it can lead to helplessness, it can lead to loneliness. But when you've lived with OCD for so long, before finding help, by the time you do find help, um, you probably have felt all of these things, helplessness, hopelessness, aloneness, loneliness. But also, if you've ever experienced treatment that isn't exposure response prevention, if you've gone through the, the processes of, of seeing therapist after therapist, doing talk therapy, you start to believe, or, or you've had the right therapist and the right treatment, but the wrong therapist, and you just didn't jive, it's very quickly easy to believe that your OCD is different, that something is wrong with you, that your OCD is more severe or harsher or worse than any anybody else's. Your symptomatology is different. Nobody's ever had those thoughts or feelings before. Um, and, and, and that's a really difficult place to operate from. Um, great question, Slow. Um, stay tuned. I'll work my way down as we start to, to build on um, questions. So for me, I know by the time I reached exposure response prevention 17 years after first being diagnosed, um, I was pretty certain that my OCD was different because I was told I had OCD, nobody could help me figure it out. And then by the time I, I found ERP, I was pretty certain that I was the sickest. And, and that nobody had seen my kind of OCD. And as I got there and I worked with other people and in, individuals in the group who kind of have these weird arguments about whose OCD was worse, and not that anybody would wish that, but in these groups, we would kind of raid each other's OCD and it would be frustrating. Like we would fight for our OCD to be, well, actually I think mine is worse than hers. Mine's maybe a 90, hers is an 88. And when somebody would say there was worse than mine, I would get frustrated and be like, no, it's not. I do X, Y, and Z. I don't know why we'd ever be defending our OCD, hoping that it's worse than somebody else's. But, you know, you get into this mindset uh, <laughs> where, where you do. Um, so, yeah, yeah, you, you oftentimes can think um, your OCD experience is unique to yourself, which 
the experience is, but the OCD in and of itself is completely different and manifesting unlike anything that anyone has ever seen before. And this can very much be a dangerous spot to be in. And it's so common, but it's a very dangerous spot to be in because as they said, it, it creates hopelessness, as they said, as, as um, oh my gosh, I just blanked, it's been a long day. As Jennifer, as Jennifer said, it can create helplessness. It can create hopelessness. It's a barrier to treatment. If I had truly believed or understood that my OCD at the end of the day was no different than anybody else's OCD, and I can explain what I mean by that later if, if, if that statement confuses you because different people have different symptoms, but at the end of the day, OCD is OCD. The content is irrelevant, I'm not saying it isn't valid, but it is irrelevant at a certain point. I think that would have really helped me in treatment from the beginning. I, I just would have bought in a lot sooner, but I can tell you, and somebody mentioned the OCDI, which is uh, the residential program at McLean at Harvard, that I sat at the OCDI and Debbie wrote, living at the OCDI, you feel at home as nobody feels different. And that is such a great experience um, to have, except I remember that I sat at the OCDI and I didn't relate to anybody. I wasn't willing to. I was already convinced by that point that I couldn't be helped. My OCD was completely different and I can't relate to anybody here. I would sit in that square. If you've been there, you know it and in, in the room and we do the assessment at the end of the day and I just had my head down and thought to myself, I can't relate to anyone here because my OCD is different, which didn't help anyone and it definitely didn't help me um, and was probably pretty egotistical, but I truly believed that. Um, so yeah, it's a big problem to think your OCD is different because it really is a barrier to treatment. And I just think this is an important topic to talk about, um, because for, well, for, for a variety of reasons, but I think it's an important topic because I don't think we realize we do that. I think there's some unconscious or, um, some subconscious, sorry, uh, some subconscious things that are going on where we we don't necessarily realize that we're treating ourselves differently or thinking we're special. So quickly before I dive into questions, why is it diff why is it not different? Why is OCD like OCD like OCD? So let's break it down. So yes, OCD manifests in a variety of subtypes and symptoms. Contamination, self-harm, sexual orientation, uh, pedophilia, um, um, moral scrupulosity, religious scrupulosity, there's all the categories, right? And those are different. Those are different. We all manifest in a different way, but we all share the common goal of seeking certainty and doubting the thoughts that we're having and un being unwilling at times to live with the discomfort and seek out the certainty. So OCD, if you think of it as like a tornado, OCD is a tornado, is a tornado that we all share what that tornado is going over and sucking in, that's all unique to us. But at the end of the day, it's still a tornado and it's still the tornado that affects all of us, whether it's a cow or a car or a house or, or Dorothy, whatever it sucks into the tornado, um, that can be perceived as our symptoms. But in, in essence, um, the tornado itself is, is OCD. And when you, start to understand that you are not your OCD. OCD is a disorder, not a decision. You hear me say that all the time. And, and you start to treat it as such and realize that you, the individual are special. The OCD is not. Um, it really helps just framing how to approach treatment and therapy and how to dive in and really believe that you and the people around you, if you're in a residential can and will get better. Um, especially if you let go of this idea that your OCD is completely unique to you um, and unlike anything else. And I'm not saying there's not additional, you may disagree with me, that's okay. We can have we can have a conversation about it. And that's not to say that there's not um, unique situations that, that complicate OCD. Maybe there's additional physical illnesses or comorbid additional uh, mental illnesses or physical illnesses that are co-occurring with OCD. And those are unique circumstances. And But in essence, OCD in and of itself is, is my OCD is no different than your OCD is no different than your OCD is no different than your OCD. But I can listen to somebody else's symptomatology and think, man, that'd be much better to have. I would rather have that guy's or that girl's OCD than my OCD. When in reality, they're struggling and suffering just as much. Um, so I hope that makes sense to everybody. Just food for thought. Um, I think it's important to to again, hit home the idea of we are individuals, 
we are unique. We are one of a kind. No one else is like us. Um, and just because that's the case doesn't mean that OCD is that also. Um, so it impact, and, and I also want to say that, you know, I know a lot of people say, a lot of therapists and clinicians say the content is irrelevant. I, I don't know that I'd go so far to say the content is irrelevant. I think when it comes to treatment, it may or may not be irrelevant, but it is relevant when it comes to stigma. And it is relevant with, with it when it comes to how we relate to our own OCD. Um, there's a reason why certain subtypes of OCD, like um, intrusive sexual violent thoughts, taboo aspects of OCD are just that taboo OCD, right? That we don't talk about them as much is because I think, I think the content in that sense is different. You relate to it different. There's a stigma at attached to it. That's, that's a lot more stigmatizing than maybe germs or, or something else. No way saying the pain is better or worse. We're not, we don't want to compare subtypes, but I think there are situations um, where, where symptoms uh, come with a different, they come with different baggage, so to speak, and, and, and the way we and the outside world relate to them. And in those, in those situations, I think content does matter. Um, but in relation to treatment and in relation to getting better and in relation to staying well, content doesn't matter. Um, ERP doesn't care what the content is. You can use it for all kinds of content. With that, let me start scrolling through your comments, questions. Um, and uh, I wanted to talk about um, who commented on the, uh, I don't remember, I apologize, but whoever commented on the um, alcoholism or substance use, yes, you are correct. Lots of research needs to happen. However, um, there are things that are happening that are, that are fantastic, that are, that are research based in uh, substance use disorder, so SUDS and OCD and co-occurring conditions. Um, so I would invite you, a, to check out Riley's Wish Foundation. We'll put a link for you. That's Margaret Sisson runs that. Uh, that specific organization is, is uh, specifically directed toward um, uh, mental uh, OCD and substance um, use. And uh, it, it's a really important organization. Also, um, Patrick McGrath, who we've had on virtual town halls, has the one and only residential treatment program in the country that treats um, OCD and substance use disorder simultaneously. And so we are making good strides in that department. So, and you can also go to the IOCD, IOCDF uh, website, IOCDF.org um, to find out more information, but that is good news, but you're absolutely correct. It, it is hard uh, to, to diagnose and treat. Typically a lot of places want to treat it separately, which only then lets the thing that's not being treated get worse. And so, but we are having a lot of conversations and have been for the past years around how to address these issues. So thank you for bringing that up. Um, I think it was Debbie, actually, now that I think about it. Um, if you joined me last week, you also know that my nose starts to itch during every live stream, and I have no clue why. Uh, so um, I'm going to sit with discomfort for the next 40 minutes um, and uh, and call me out if I itch my nose. So it itches right now. I'm not going to touch it. So uh, Lori wrote, my son was just diagnosed with OCD. He's 17, and he has intrusive thoughts. He was diagnosed when he went into a cannabis-induced psychosis. It was so traumatic, and now his brain is still healing four months later. He's on Lexapro and, and antipsychotic medication. I want to help him. Every day is literally baby steps. He has no motivation. I'm so sad for my boy, and I feel hopeless some days. Lori, I, I, I'm so sorry to hear that. It sounds like an awful situation or was an awful situation. I'm, I'm glad to hear that he is healing slowly. I can tell you that even without what happened to you, to, even without what happened to your son, the process of getting better with OCD is a slow process and can be a slow process. And patience can be hard, especially when you're seeing a loved one or a son or a daughter um, or child, I should say, uh, suffer and struggle. Um, the good news is, is you're here. And, um, and you know, he's, I, I, again, I, I don't like to speak to medication because I'm not a therapist, but, you know, he's on an SSRI and potentially something else that may, that may help as well as, you know, if you're here, then maybe you've been to the, I don't know if you've seen a clinician and doing exposure response prevention, but the process can be slow and that's okay. I promise you there is help, there's hope, there's support. I'm glad to see that your son is getting help. I know it can be really hard and you can feel hopeless some days. And you know what? Sometimes it's okay. Like we have to give ourselves permission and for grace and give ourselves a lot of self-compassion when we feel that. Um, but also know that maybe that's a hard day, but at the end of the day, 
things will get better. That's what we hope for, for sure. And so I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're, you're that because if you're here, that just tells me that you have access to articles and treatment modalities and people and things like that, that like me and so many didn't have access to um, when we were struggling. So I, I wish you the best, Lori. I always give out my email at the end. Please feel free to email me if you'd like to talk further. And that goes for anybody watching, of course. Nick Toss, sorry I'm late. That's just, Let's boot him. Working in mountain time zone. Sorry. Sorry, Nick. You know, you need to get out of that time zone. It really is a, a, a crappy time zone. Um, Rachel wrote, my son has had OCD since third grade. Why do they keep their rituals guarded? We know when he is, when he is in th those thoughts, but tries to hide it. He is now 25 and remains in therapy and treatment. Thank you, Jess. I appreciate you posting that. Um, well, the, well, first of all, I hope that, um, your son is in, is engaged in exposure response prevention, and that is the treatment that he is in. It's the gold standard of treatment. I can never say it enough. Um, there are other treatments that are effective, um, but ERP is is the gold standard baseline. Um, so that is the therapy that he wants to you want to have him in most definitely. Hopefully that is the case, Rachel. Um, if, if it is not, we can definitely uh, direct you um, to some to some places with that. And and I think honestly. Um, you guys can answer this question as well. Um, why, why do you guard your rituals? The reality is they're embarrassing. They're embarrassing. We don't want to do them. Rit rituals are not something we want to do. Um, compulsions are not something we want to do. Um, and logically, to some extent, we know we don't need to do them or shouldn't, but they relieve a sen they relieve an a emotion, a feeling. A they relieve the anxiety. And, ah, I touched my nose. See, that was a compulsion. No, I just itch during, but they relieve that uneasiness or that just right, that this really unnerving feeling that we want to get rid of. And so we in no way want to wash our hands 500 times or take an eight hour shower or, or whatever it is. But we do it because to some extent in our minds, it relieves, it relieves the anxiety, but we keep it guarded because we're embarrassed by that. We don't want to have to do it. And sometimes we feel like we have to do it. Sometimes we feel like we can't not do it when it's always a choice. But um, depending how fused you are with the OCD, um, sometimes it doesn't feel like a choice. Most of the time, it doesn't feel like a choice until you've had treatment and therapy. Um, it doesn't feel like a choice. It feels like it's something you have to do to get rid of the feeling. But as you can probably speak to, Rachel, um, the cycle is, is, is ongoing. And when you compulse, it relieves the anxiety for a short amount of time. That's why we do it because it does work in the beginning, but the more we do it, the less effective it is. And then that just gets us in the cycle of obsession, compulsion, obsession, compulsion until the compulsions take over our life. But in terms of, of, of keeping the rituals guarded, it's out of embarrassment. Um, and, and I, I'd be curious to see if anybody house has, um, has any, uh, any other thoughts as to why they keep rituals guarded, but Rachel, hopefully that helped answer your question. Uh, slow wrote, Hey Ethan, any medicine, peripheral vision, OCD staring. Um, again, I don't talk medication and that is such a new area of research, but I will tell you that we just did, um, a compulsive staring town hall. Was it the last one? Um, with Dr. Grayson, who is pioneering the research on this. Um, it was either the last one of the, no, we did anger and rage last time. So the town hall from two weeks ago. If you go into the Facebook or YouTube and check it out, I think it's called Compulsive Staring. Um, check it out. It's a great town hall. He talks about a myriad of issues around that and other types of OCD staring. So I literally, he's he's you know just breaking ground on the research. There's some lived experience as well. So definitely check that out. All, all, all the they're the experts. All the questions uh, um, that you probably have, I don't know, they'll be answered there. But that is definitely the best resource that we have um, on that right now. So thank you, Slow, for asking that. Um, Mario wrote, I did four years of psychotherapy. Unfortunately, my therapist didn't believe in CBT. We were doing the old therapy style based on talking about childhood. I stopped the therapy as it didn't help. Mario, welcome to my, my 17 years was talking about my childhood and looking for the thing that caused the thing that, that, that made the thing happen that now I have my thoughts and think about it and I'm the way I am. And every time, um, yep, there's twice I touched my nose. Every time I went through it, I just got sicker and sicker and sicker and sicker. Um, I, I'm sorry for that. Um, and I hope in some way, uh, you've been able to access, uh, treatment. I've been working with a lot of people internationally, um, helping them link to, uh, to, to treatment in the States because everything is virtual. Different countries have different rules, um, in terms of that and ethics and things like that. But there are a number of psychotherapists, uh, psychotherapists, there are a number of, uh, 
cognitive behavioral therapist in the States that will do uh, online therapy or teletherapy internationally. So Mario, I don't currently know what your situation is, but if you're looking or or, or, or curious or whatever, uh, don't hesitate to shoot me an email or shoot the IOCDF an email. Again, I'll give those out at the end of, of the call and we'll, we'll, we'll try to get you uh, set up. Um, but I totally, totally, totally relate to that. Um, yeah, Marilyn wrote, and I think she was answering your question, Rachel. For some, it's embarrassing. We know it's not normal and often don't understand why we're like that. That's, uh, 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 so, uh, oh, and so Rachel wrote, I agree, but he finally tells me he feels so much better. Are you talking about when he tells you about the compulsion? I would imagine so. And that makes sense too. Nobody wants to keep secrets and nobody wants to hide things. And so we're going to hide it because we're doing it so much um, and we don't want you to know. But it's carrying a burden. And when you relieve that burden, it feels better. Um, but it doesn't mean that we're not going to keep hiding it and keep carrying that burden because at the end of the day, um, especially without the right education or whatever, you could think that something's wrong with you or you're weak for doing it. Um, there's a myriad of reasons why um, you would continue to hide it. But I think I think they, um, I think that's a great answer for sure. Scroll down here and see if anybody um, weighed in on the conversation. Um, what I was just talking about. I don't see anything. Um, so let me jump back up. And I always do that. I lose my place. I apologize, folks. Um, oh, where was I? Seven. It's been a long day. <laughs> Bear with me. Technical brain difficulties. Um, Katie, I mean, uh, Jess, we're... Where was I? Um, okay, I got it. Apologies. Um, so dear Jerod, I was <laughs> ah, 7.15. Yes, thank you, Jess. I appreciate it. Dear Jerod, I was always treated by family. I was different, crazy, but wow, it is great to hear other stories, even details to feel validated in what I was experienced. Absolutely. Um, Debbie wrote, OCD is not rational. Therefore, you respect others' OCD. Absolutely. Uh, Eileen wrote, my OCD makes me mumble stuff and blurt stuff out. It's that really uncommon or is that pretty common? Um, you know, Eileen, I, I don't know your exact situation. Um, and, and I'm not a clinician. I will tell you that there are a lot of comorbid conditions or related disorders like, like Tourette's syndrome and different Tourette's and things like that. Um, whether you're actually blurting things out, you think you blurt things out. There's a variety of iterations of that, but I would sit here and say, you know, I, I would never call anything uncommon or or put you in a box that's saying like, oh, well, that's really obscure. Um, I can't tell you how many clinicians I've talked to that have been like, yeah, I've, I've heard that a thousand times. Um, so, you know, my first advice is to definitely, um, you know, seek out treatment, seek out help, seek out therapy. Um, at the very least, connect with a uh, an expert that can maybe give you some insight. Not a doctor. I will tell you that a thousand times. I'm not an expert. But what I will tell you is I've talked to a lot of people that have had similar symptoms. Um, you know, whether that's Tourette's or a product of your OCD, I honestly don't know, but you are definitely not alone in that, Eileen. I can tell you that for sure. Um, <laughs> Michelle wrote, yes, wow, I literally thought I was the only one who was thinking my OCD isn't like anyone else's. My OCD is the worst there ever is. Yep, absolutely. Let's put that to bed because I think that's such a barrier to treatment. Um, Mario wrote, I started online therapy two months ago based on ERP. After 10 sessions, I stopped again because the connection with my new therapist wasn't so good. So I'm still struggling with a lot of anxiety. That can happen too, Mario. And I'm and I'm, I'm sorry to hear that. Um, it's tricky. I mean, it's a tricky, tricky process. And I think that some ERP is better than no ERP. Um, for those of you that don't know, John Grayson's book, Freedom from OCD, is probably the best book out there in terms of learning about exposure response prevention and how to integrate it into your life. Um, so I would definitely suggest you, you check that out. Uh, Jess will put a link um, there in a few on that. I would also say that a lot of times we have to hold ourselves accountable for the ERP, and it's not always the therapist's fault. You know, um, ERP is really uncomfortable. It's just an, it's exposure to your fears and sitting with the discomfort and not being able to compulse and ritualize. And, you know, um, and I'm not in any way saying Mario that you didn't have a good connection with your therapist, but you know, I hated my ERP therapist. I, I they were not my friends it's, or so I thought until I started to get better. I'm like, Oh, maybe they're up to something. Uh, they know something that I don't know. Um, so, you know, we don't want to think of our relationships with a therapist as we do traditionally with a therapist. When you're like, Oh, I'm going to go to therapy. We're going to connect and bond and, um, and I'm going to leave feeling better. That's not this. Um, Rachel wrote, it's hard as a parent 
because you know they are hurting. Those of you that have OCD are one of the strongest people. My son is a music teacher and lives successfully with OCD and admire all his strength and all of you. Thank you, thank you, Rachel. That's very sweet of you uh, to say. Let me let me scroll down here to see if I have any questions. Um, let's see here. Um, Amber wrote, it took me a long time to get diagnosed because I thought no one else has these thoughts. No one is like me in a bad way. It took a while to be open with my doctors. Absolutely. And that's why what we do, that's why we do what we do. You know, we want as many people to be able to talk about it as possible. We, we, we want to destigmatize this. We want, I mean, if you can't talk to an expert, if you can't talk to a clinician, then who can you talk to? So if you know, your first point of, con I almost touched my nose, but I held myself. Your first point of contact most likely isn't going to be an ERP specialist or an OCD specialist. It's probably going to be a doctor or a psychiatrist. So the more that we can advocate and get the word out there and educate clinicians to at least be able to identify it and, and be able to, uh, to better understand these more, um, these more tab, I hate to use the word taboo, but these, uh, these more lesser spoken about um, subtypes. I was just having this conversation today with my friend, Steven, who, who runs, who's the CEO of NoCD. Uh, we were doing a presentation and we talked a lot about how, how, you know, prevalent, um, sexual, violent, intrusive harm based thoughts are, and, you know, and how probably there are as many, if not more suffering from, from those particular thoughts than others. It's just, they're not talked about, you know, you turn on the news, it's a picture of hand washing. And it's a picture of germs. And it's and again, in no way minimizing people that have hand washing or germs or checking. It's not about that. It's simply being able to normalize in some way some of these more stigmatized sub symptoms and subtypes so we can have open and honest conversations with them and help educate the people that can direct you all to the right places as opposed to being like, yeah, here's some meds and let's talk about your childhood. And, you know, and we go down the Mario Ethan path. So um, thank you, Gretchen. I'm glad you liked the tornado analogy. It was told to me. I cannot steal that. Um, Amber wrote, it took me a long time to get diagnosed because I thought no one else. Oh, I read that already. That brought back that whole conversation. So with perfectionist OCD, uh, with perfectionists, it can get tough. As I was told that oftentimes they have to watch how far they push you. We push ourselves to the max and there can be burnout. That is true, you know, but perfectionism is also a discomfort, right? It's and living, living with the uncertainty that it is not perfect. And so there are a lot of crossovers with that. And so, you know, leave that up to the, to the clinicians and the experts, but it, it's, it's different for everybody. Um, you know, but, uh, with perfectionism, I would say, you know, the, the general exposure is to make mistakes is to let it go. I know for me, I was rereading emails for many years, especially emails that were really important business related emails because I was afraid there'd be typos or that I missed a word or that I would say something dumb and I would lose my job or you know, it went down the rabbit hole of, of crap that was gonna happen to me. Um, and now I send emails all the time and people will tell you like, I, I, if I do read them back, I'm pretty embarrassed because I've generally left out lots of words. And uh, and it's just like, it is what it is, you know, and, and, and I have a lot, I have a lot more free time. If you add up the hours I was taking to reread the emails over and over again, I send an email once and I move on with my life and you know, that's okay. If people can think what they think, uh, it's I, I'm not great at that all the time, but that's the general approach. So if you get an email from me and it looks ridiculous, now you know why. Um, Debbie wrote, imagine the stigma of dual diagnosis. And I feel bad for many in AA who smell like an OCD person. Uh, but they don't know it. Uh, smell like is kind of an interesting term. I get what you were saying, Debbie. And, um, you know, what I'll say is it, it's, it's, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't diagnose, um, anybody with, uh, with OCD, you know, um, but there are definitely tendencies and, uh, and the co-occurring condition of substance use and OCD is is more common than people talk about. So you're probably right. There are a number of people at those groups that probably are struggling with OCD. And uh, and you know, I mean, we know that uh, that alcohol and substances can you know it's one of the only things that numb the mind and make the thoughts stop. Right. So so it, it, it makes total sense. And actually, just below your comment, Debbie, at 7:22 p.m. is the link to Riley's Wish. If you'd like to check that out. Um, so thank you, Jess, for posting that. Um, Rachel wrote, my son will say that his, that his brain doesn't shut off only when it sleeps. Do many of you feel this way? I have a feeling some people answered, answered you. Uh, it's very common. Sleep is, 
is is one of the few ways that that a lot of people really struggling, including myself when I was really struggling, could get away. What's sad is also the OCD can get into your sleep and affect your dreams and you wake and wake up in a panic. And I would wake up constantly thinking I had compulsed in my sleep or what if I'd hurt myself in my sleep and then I didn't want to sleep and it can get pretty messy. So that's very common. Um, and yes, you are right. They will not let you in the OCDI if you are getting sober, Debbie, um, which is why, you know, we're, we're working on on the process of being able to treat everything simultaneously. Um, that is not to, to say though that the OCDI doesn't do uh, amazing work because they've helped a lot of folks. I was there, I'm one of them. Oh, I was kicked out, but I was one of them and they're amazing folks. Um, let's see, feel free to continue asking me questions. I love that you guys are having really in-depth conversation um, with each other and supporting each other about tools. Um, Marilyn wrote, and, and, and as I encourage you to ask questions, we can go back to talking about why your brain is different. Uh, I may tangent here in a minute, but uh, Marilyn wrote, I find myself telling my brain to shut up sometimes when it feels, uh, when the hamster wheel is going. Absolutely. And that's so common, Marilyn, for all of us, I think we can all relate um, to the hamster wheel. You know, um, a therapy that I talk about all the time, which is acceptance commitment therapy, also an exposure-based therapy, and usually an adjunct to exposure response prevention, but also just as effective as a, or becoming as effective as a uh, mainline treatment. You know, um, sometimes our brain won't shut up and it then becomes our job to let our brain do its thing and not engage in it. And it's difficult to do, especially when our brain is loud, but you know, it's the pink elephant analogy. The more I tell my brain to shut up and pay attention to it, the louder it's gonna get. The more I tell the pink elephant to go away, the more I'm gonna think of the pink elephant. So sometimes when your brain is screaming, the best thing to do is just let it scream and try not to engage in it. You know, let, let the noise be there. Um, What's an example? Uh, chirping from your from your smoke detector when you're sleeping. It's annoying, but at a certain point, you just got to tune it out and go to sleep. And a lot of us can't. A lot of us can't. It annoys the crap out of me. But there's this idea of coexisting with these thoughts, with these feelings, with, with the brain screaming at us, right? Um, and when we coexist with it, we don't give it power. Uh, we, we And it will fizzle out. It will quiet down. You don't feed it. Um, so... I like an aggressive approach to OCD, like, you know, shut up, I'm not listening to you. I like that. But if you find yourself constantly talking to your OCD or arguing with it, um, then you might want to consider possibly letting go and letting the conversation happen and, and just not being a part of it. Example, um, I was struggling with weight loss maybe about five or six years ago, and I called my therapist from the OCDI. Um, who is really brilliant at act. I think he's still there, Nate Gruner. And um, and Nate, I was telling him, he said, what are you struggling with? And I said, well, you know, I'll, I'll be working and I'll realize, oh, it's two o'clock, I should go for a walk. But then I'll realize, oh, there's all these emails and I need to answer them. And if I don't answer them, you know, things are going to get behind and people will think I'm not working hard. And, you know, earning a living is value driven, but working out is value driven. And, and I'll start going back and forth between what I should and shouldn't do. And he said, he said, is it possible to just let your brain argue? And while it's arguing, you go for a walk. And I'm like, Hmm, <laughs> that's an interesting premise. So let the conversation be there and just move my body. And I did. And it was hard. Don't get me wrong. Cause you get stuck. But if you're like, if you just let your brain argue with itself and you're just like, you two argue, I'm going to be over here doing what's important. And, you know, great. Was I present? Totally. No, but I got a good walk in and my brain argued and we moved on to the next thing. So sometimes just existing with it is the best course of action. Um, ah, question, Amber, I can't convince myself to start ERP for my big obsession. I'm too scared. Can I do ERP for smaller obsessions and still see progress on the big one? That's a great question. So, um, so I'm not sure if you're already in treatment or, or, or therapy or doing ERP. Generally, a clinician will build a hierarchy with you and you'll start to um, climb the hierarchy, the hierarchy, the top of your hierarchy being, as you call it, your big obsession and the bottom of your hierarchy being something that may bother you, but is easy, easier to address at the beginning. And then everything in the middle being a little bit more um, anxiety provoking. 
I think what helps you, and I can't speak for everybody, be curious if people want to weigh in, as always, feel free to. Um, what helps with the big one is is successfully conquering. It's not it's not the dissipation of the old obsessions that will help the big obsession. It's seeing that the ERP works and it's seeing that the treatment works and it can really um, extinguish some of your obsessions, whether they're smaller obsessions or medium sized obsessions. And then I would challenge you to be willing to be super uncomfortable and even scared, if not scaring the crap out of yourself to really get a hold of that big obsession and kind of knock it down and knock it out of the way. Here's the reality. The reality is, is if we're going to knock the big, the only way um, to knock out that big obsession is through, not around. We can't go around it. We have to go through it. So the question is, Amber, what kind of life do you want for yourself? What are the things that are important to you? Are you doing those things now? And how interfering is the big obsession in, in, is, in your life. And when you identify those things, you need to weigh, right? Almost like a cost benefit analysis. You need to weigh what the advantages of addressing the big obsession versus not addressing the big obsession. If you've engaged in smaller ERPs with smaller obsession, obsessions, you've learned that the feelings are uncomfortable, but they're not dangerous. They're not going to kill you. Um, and I know that the anticipation around facing the big obsession might be horrific and the anxiety associated with it. But what I can tell you is um, many individuals with OCD kind of live in the state of negotiation where they get only so far. And then they're like, you know what, this is good enough. I don't need to tackle that sort of last thing that's bothering me. I'm, I'm doing enough and I'm able to function and get by. I can tell you, and I've said this to many people, um, sort of for my own experience, that last piece, that last 10% was actually the biggest had the biggest change in my life because up until then getting everything un under control moved me from non-functioning to functioning, which is great. We all want to function. What I didn't realize though, that there's something beyond functioning, which is being present and experiencing the emotions, joy, happiness, sadness, anger, whatever it is, but experiencing experiencing them. And ideally experiencing as much joy and happiness as possible. Now I would never tell you do ERP to feel better and feel happiness all the time because that's not realistic. But what I can tell you is when I when I really dove in and was willing to scare the absolute crap out of myself um, around my biggest fears, that's when I started to experience the, the true amazing benefits, not only of the treatment, but of life and what life has to offer and didn't realize how much beauty was in life until I, I, I got through that fear. And then I was like, oh, wow, this is, this is incredible. And so, you know, I would encourage anybody, although scary and and you know i can't be in your shoes amber i can tell you that at least having faced my own fear uh it was terrifying and it, it, it you know and and i had to go to a really dark place to do it and i needed a lot of support to do it and it was not easy but it was the best thing i ever did and so um i would encourage you to lay out your values think about what you're missing think about the things that you want to do in your life and think about think about what the big obsession is inhibiting you from and and go from there so i would say that the erp should um, inspire you to want to uh, conquer the big obsessions. But eliminating the other obsessions may or may not have an impact. So that was a very long, I'm just long-winded. I'm, I'm willing to accept that. Uh, let's keep uh, going down here. Um, and Gwen, Gwen, I, lo I love this group. You guys are so on top of this. So Gwen said, you can definitely start small and get more comfortable and familiar with the process of ERP. In my humble opinion, you'll need to address the big obsession eventually, but you may be able to relieve some chronic stress from working on your smaller obsessions with ERP. That was a lot more concise than my answer. So thank you, Gwen. Well said. Um, so appreciate that. Um, Let's see. Uh, are there any studies relating OCD and seizures? That's a great question, Catherine. Uh, Catherine, Catherine. Um, I don't know. Um, it's a little out of, out of my wheelhouse. But if you want to um, send that question over to, uh, we'll, again, we'll give you some emails. We can we can forward that on. It's probably more of a neurology question, but I'm sure some psychologists or some individuals that have studied that we can get you an answer for sure. Um, so thank you for that question. I apologize that I can't answer. I honestly don't know what the research shows. Um, let's see, uh, is reassurance seeking a compulsion? What a great question. Uh, 7.32 PM, Jill asks it. Hopefully Jill is still here. Yes. 
Reassurance seeking is a compulsion. It is one of the biggest compulsions. Um, it, can, it can affect anyone with um, with OCD and whatever the subtype is. There's a myriad. I, myriad is the word of the day. I don't think I've ever used that word in months, but I'm using it tonight. Um, reassurance. Uh, there's a variety of ways one can seek reassurance. There's overt ways. There's subtle ways. I, I like to be really crafty with my reassurance. But yes, 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 yes. Reassurance seeking is a compulsion. Um, and, you know, it's it's. It's re that that sense of reassurance is designed around seeking out that certainty, and um, and so for me, you know, when I was really ill, I got CAT scans because I was afraid I hurt my head. So yes, getting a CAT scan was the compulsion. The reassurance was knowing my brain was okay. Uh, of course, that only lasted for a few minutes until I thought something was wrong with my brain again, and then I wanted it. But a reassurance can be as something as simple as, and I used to do this all the time. I'm curious if you guys can relate. Um, what if somebody's mad at me? I'm afraid so and so's mad at me. Let me send them a text, and if they answer back fairly quickly and they put like a a good emoji or they seem they seem in a good mood, then everything's okay. Like even even something as simple as that is is reassurance. I don't have to ask them, "Are you okay? Are you mad at me?" Me just reaching out and them connecting back will give me the reassurance that I need. Um. So yes, reassurance is a compulsion. That's a great question. Um. Sorry, uh, Freedom from OCD. Thank you for putting that link just at 7.35 p.m. It is a great book. Uh, and yes, Mario, the author's name is Jonathan Grayson. Um, so thank you. And some people love. Uh, also, Gwen wrote The Mindfulness Workbook for OCD by John uh, by my Hirschfeld and Corboy. Uh, John Hirschfeld's books are awesome. He's written five or six of them. I love John. He's a great guy and a brilliant clinician. So definitely feel free to look up The Mindfulness workup, Workbook as well as many of his other um many of his other works. Sorry, I was reading reading on. Um, do they have an online support group for OCD on Zoom? It's a great question, Debbie. So um, Mike Sizemore, I don't know if you're still on here. Mike started a Zoom support group at the beginning of COVID. Um, I can tell you that there are a number of support groups um, that are being led virtually, depending on where you live. Um, a lot of them are free. Uh, you can go to the OCD, uh, the IOCDF website. Um as well as reach out to local clinicians in your area, depending on where you live. And they may have local support groups as well. Um, as well as there, we have um, a, a couple options for large communities where you can at least connect. Uh, one is Health Unlocked, we'll put a link to that. That is IOCDF's virtual community. And there's lots, I think we have three or 4,000 people now. And um, there's always constant conversation going on there um, in regards to OCD. Also, uh, we always like to talk about the No CD app. You heard me mention Stephen before. Uh, the No CD app is available in the Apple Store and Google Play. It is free to download. It is a massive, hundreds of thousands of, of individuals with OCD, a massive online community. They also offer uh, teletherapy, um, ERP. They specialize in ERP therapy. They're available in all 50 states. And you can get a free 15-minute um phone call to see if the, you're a fit for their program. Um, and in fact, some insurance, they're covered in all 50 states by some insurance companies. So it can alleviate the cost quite a bit. So um, check out NoCD, that's N-O-C-D um, on the Apple Store. And they did not pay me for that. I'm just, they do good work. And uh, and Steven, they're all good friends of the IOCD app. So definitely check that out. Hopefully that helps. Um, and yes, Barbara, you're right. Sometimes we need to be our own advocates. And, you know, we can say, unfortunately, but I think we have an opportunity to um, to change and, and pave the way for people that maybe they won't have to be. You know, um, I'm, I, I feel blessed and, and grateful for my experiences that have put me here in front of you and to be able to advocate. And yes, it is unfortunate that that we're in this situation. Right. And that that OCD is so misunderstood still after all these years and um, and so stigmatized. And that is unfortunate for sure. And so for that reason, you're absolutely correct. But um, um, I know oh. <laughs> anyway, that is that is correct. But, um, you know, absolutely. We have an amazing opportunity to to advocate and all of you just by being here doing that very thing. I, I distracted myself because um, Barbara wrote literally right after Debbie's question. Um, no CD app. So I am way behind and I apologize. People are much quicker on chat. Um, uh, Renee wrote, absolutely the first therapist I went to made me feel like I was an awful person. My current therapist does ERP and she got me so far. I love to hear that. Um, 
So let's see if we have any questions. I know we're running low. Does hypnosis help with OCD? Mario wrote, I found some videos on YouTube about it. Do you recommend it? Um, I honestly don't know. There's not a lot of research to show that that hypnosis is effective with, with, with OCD. I will always, always, always um, push exposure response prevention is the primary treatment for OCD. Uh, Mario, as you said, you know, you didn't have a good relationship with your first therapist. I would definitely encourage you to continue looking. Do not give up on ERP. Um, it is by far the most effective. It is not the only treatment, uh, but it is by far the most effective in the first place. It's not the second place and third place. We will try it. Look, the reality is ERP is really hard. Okay. That's just the reality. And the reality is that we may not get it the first time around. And candidly, more times than not, we let the ERP down more than ERP lets us down. And I know that was my case, not making a blanket generalization, but it's hard to engage in the ERP. And we really, we're doing ERP and we check in with ourselves and we really ask ourselves, are we challenging ourselves? Are we scaring ourselves? Are we sitting with the discomfort and looking to our values or are we just white knuckling? Um, there's a lot of things we, most of us can realize we can do better uh, when we're doing ERP, but there are other modalities of treatment, acceptance, commitment therapy, I really responded to, and it really helped in conjunction with exposure response prevention. Um, as well as now dialectical behavioral therapy, DBT, is not specific for OCD, but it helps greatly with mindfulness and emotional regulation. It was also very effective. So um, so I can tell you, Mario, man, feel free to email me. I feel for you, Mario. I feel for everybody here, obviously, but I feel for you, Mario, because I went, so after I saw a thousand psychiatrists or psychologists talking on childhood, I then was like, I got to, there's got to be something else. I, I got to be missing something. So I saw hypnosis. I saw an energy healer, I saw Reiki, um, and I did past life regression as well. None of those helped. They were interesting, but none of those helped. Um, so when, as you, you call out these things, it reminds me of my journey um, and to find, finally finding somebody with the right treatment. Um, stick with it. And again, you know, email me and we can see what we can find out. Um, do I need to see an OCD therapist to treat my OCD? Ideally, yes, Eileen, but no, I mean, the thing is, the, and, and maybe we'll end on this, um, there are a couple other questions, we'll go a little bit over, but I want to be respectful of your time and just behind the scenes as well. So ideally, you're working with a therapist or a clinician. That is the ideal situation. Unfortunately, we know that accessibility is difficult, cost is difficult, demographics is difficult. There's, there's a lot of reasons why accessing treatment um, can be difficult. And so we don't ever like to say that, no, you can't treat your own OCD. In fact, if you're working with a therapist, the magic that happens is not in the therapist's office once a week. It happens while you're at home and what you're doing by yourself. It's the OCD, the ERP homework that really helps you get better, um, not the once or twice a week visits, what you're doing in between that counts. So the first answer to your question is, is ideally you're working with an, an OCD expert. With that in mind, there are self-help um, options available, ranging from the book that I said, Freedom from OCD, ranging to support groups, ranging from um, um, social media accounts. Not that I would ever say your 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 um, OCD treatment should be a, a, a social media account, but at least for inspiration and some guidelines. You can also check out Kimberly Quinlan's CBTSchool.com. Jess will put a link to that as well. CB, CBTSchool.com is a um, is a series of courses all based around ERP as well. They're excellent. Also, the IOCDF. I don't know if the website's up, but um, Peace of Mind had OCD Challenge, and I think the IOCDF when they merged absorbed that. I'm not 100% sure on that, but OCD Challenge was also ability to work ERP with yourself. But ideally, you're working with a therapist. That is not to say I've known people and talked to many people who have got better on their own. But again, keep in mind it's the work that you do in between sessions that really makes the difference. Um, so I'll end on Renee's question. Um, Renee asks, 743, I'm struggling with my anxiety. And my therapist says, I need to allow the anxiety to be there and stop giving it so much validity. I feel like I can't any suggestions. So I would, I would look at your second to last sentence, Renee, which is, I feel like I can't. So sitting with your anxiety, I, I love that you said, I feel like I can't because I know that feeling. And I think so many do recognize and know that feeling, but a, it's a feeling and B, the reality is, is you won't. And, and I don't mean that sounds mean. I mean that, that it is still a choice. So what does it mean to, um, to allow the anxiety to be there and stop giving it so much validity? It means just that to, 
let the anxiety be there to make room for it, to give it space, to not resist it, to not prove something to you. It is simply your willingness to be uncomfortable. And the more you do that, the more you get used to feeling uncomfortable and the more you get used to feeling uncomfortable, the less uncomfortable it becomes until hopefully the anxiety goes away. And, and there's some benefits to understanding what anxiety is and how it works and why you feel it. But at the end of the day, that can't is just a feeling. And I would ask you to reframe can't to I'm choosing not to just sit with my anxiety. I'm not allowing it to be there. So what do I have to do to allow it to be there? The first thing is, like I said, be willing to be uncomfortable. Be okay not being okay. Secondly, what are some tools and skills and tricks? Tricks are a weird word, but schools and, school, schools and tools, tools and skills you can use to help you with sitting with your anxiety. Is it meditation? Is it going for a walk? Is it calling a friend? You can engage in what's called opposite action, which is when you feel anxiety coming on or you're uncomfortable. Instead of sitting there feeling this feeling, you know, maybe you get involved and do something that's important to you. Watch a movie, read a book, go for a walk, uh, meditate, breathe, not in an effort to get rid of it, but simply coexist with it. We're going to take the anxiety with us and do what's important to us anyway. Hope that gives you some quick tips. Um, on, on dealing with anxiety. With all of that being said, wow, thank you for the awesome, um, the awesome um, feedback and comments and so much conversation tonight. I love it. I'm and thankful for everyone here that, that contributed to answering the questions that I didn't get to. Um, you were all awesome and spot on. So thank you. Okay, so first and foremost, before anybody leaves, let's give out uh, email addresses. So if you wanna contact uh, my husband said he looked like Mark Ruffalo. I'll take it. He's also recently nominated for a Golden Globe, I think for best looking actor or something. So I, I don't know exactly, but I'm just I'm just saying. I, I do get that on occasion. So I take that as a compliment. Thank you, Renee. I digress. So um, let's give out two email addresses. One is my email, which you can reach me at justethan at iostdf.org. Please don't hesitate to email me. Um, this is around any questions that I didn't get to. If you agreed or disagreed, I'm always open for open, honest communication. Those of you who know me know that about me. Um, also, if you have topic ideas or anything that you want to talk about or address, um, please don't hesitate to email me at justethan.iocdf.org. I may take a few days, but I will always get back with you. Um, also, if you have better yet questions around resources or or getting help, things like that, I would definitely encourage you to email the IOCDF at info at IOCDF.org. This is always open. It'll always get back to you. Um, and regardless of your questions, um, this is a great email address to contact the IOCDF, whether you want to ask about advocacy or, or getting help or resources, basically all of the above. I know that people had some advocacy questions about how to get involved. Email me. Um, and coming up, we've got some programming around advocacy that we'll be talking about as well. We always like to talk about ways to get involved uh, with advocacy as well. So don't hesitate to email us. As always, I want to thank all of you for being amazing and and just just commenting and supporting and advocating for everybody here. I thank you from the bottom of my heart. I want to thank the IOCDF and, of course, my partner behind the scene, Jess, for doing her digital voodoo. Uh, if you haven't already and want to be notified about all the programming the IOCDF is having over the next month, Definitely be sure to subscribe and follow on Facebook and YouTube. You can also subscribe on Twitch. A couple things that are coming up tomorrow, 12 p.m. Eastern on Facebook and YouTube, live with Liz. We'll be taking your questions. Um, and then finally, uh, we are doing an anxiety and athlete survey. So whether you're an athlete, a parent of an athlete, or work for a sports team, we value your input on how anxiety affects the athletic community. Take the short anxiety and athletes needs assessment. Uh, boop. <laughs> By doing so, you are providing the IOCDF with valuable feedback on the resources they are needed within the athletic community regarding anxiety, OCD, BDD, and other related disorders. So please, please, if you have a second, um, click or copy and paste. Uh, we'll put it actually in the link. Since you can't copy and paste that, we'll put it in the link so you can jump on and, uh, and, and give us your input. We really, really appreciate it. Lastly, if you want to know everything that's going on in the virtual community, you can always visit iocdf.org forward slash peace of mind uh, for all of our virtual programming. And we've got a lot of it coming up as we continue to press on into 2021. With all of that, thank you for your kind comments. Thank you for all your help. Um, uh, again, feel free to email and uh, that's what we have. So as always, have a wonderful evening. 
Stay safe, stay vigilant, feel the feels, don't let OCD off the hook, and we'll see you two weeks from tonight on another Just Ethan. Have a good night.